Welcome everyone to the uh, NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group uh, August call. Uh, today we have um, a topic facilitated by uh, Nicholas Taylor, uh, who is at Stanford on International Models of Collaborative Infrastructure. Um, I'm Nathan Tallman at uh, Penn State, and we have a fairly full agenda. Um, I'm going to put in uh, to the chat a link to the agenda notes doc. We do community note taking. Um, I, I try to do as much as I can, but if you could also um, just check in and add yourself to the attendance if you're not already there um, and feel free to join in the notes as well. Um, other than that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if we have time at the end, um, I'll cover some business matters, um, but the um, main stuff is our content. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicholas. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Uh, thanks for the introduction and the invitation to help facilitate this call on international models for collaborative infrastructure. Um, so I don't, I don't always join these calls, but looking back over the, the previous agendas, it seems like there's a fairly broad scope of topics that this group concerns itself with um, that are sometimes national in nature, but also international. Um, and I think it's great that we have this opportunity today to uh, talk about infrastructure, both with a, a collaborative frame and an international frame. Uh, so to support that, we've invited five speakers to, to talk briefly today about the international collaborative infrastructure initiatives that they represent. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have a good half of the call for, for discussion and questions. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly introduce the, the presenters and then we'll just uh, get right to it. So joining us today, we have uh, Carl Wilson. He's the technical lead for the Open Preservation Foundation and uh, is representing uh, Open Preservation Foundation today. Carolyn Kaitsi, Repository and Digital Curation Department Head for Northwestern University Libraries. Uh, she's representing Sam Vera. Mark Jordan, the Associate Dean of Libraries for Digital Strategy, Strategy at Simon Fraser University, representing the Public Knowledge Project. Lauren Coe, Supervisor for Software Development at the University of North Texas Libraries, representing Open Wayback. And Natasha Millich Frailing, Professor and Chair of Data Science at the School of Computer Science at the University of Nottingham, Chair of the UNESCO Persist Program, uh, a Technology and Research Work Group. Uh, and she's representing UNESCO Persist. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn it over first to, to Carl Wilson from OPF. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I won't be speaking with slides, um, so yeah, I'll just be I'll, I'll just be speaking without visual aids, as it were. Um, yeah, my name's Carl Wilson. I'm the technical lead at the Open Preservation Foundation. We're a relatively small now. Um, I've always said small not for profit, but there's a few more of us now. But a not for profit organisation. We were formed in 2010, um, off the back of the Planets Project, a collaborative EU project. So that's an EU-wide um, initiative um, among various organisations across member states from the EU, um, which was, so we were formed out of um, a, cla <laughs> um, a collaborative effort, but we have nothing to do with the EU per se or the Planets Project anymore. And indeed, after a few years, we changed our name to the Open Preservation Foundation, which is more in line with our aim. And our aim has evolved slightly. So we really advocate for um, the use of open source solutions within digital preservation domain, or even slightly wider in the cultural heritage domain. And we do that by supporting existing open source initiatives and developing some open source software ourselves. Um, we, are, we rely on a combination of membership um, from there's maybe up to 20 national libraries and archives um, who are paying members. So they pay a sum depending on their size and income. Um, and that helps fund our activities. Um, for that, they get to steer our activities through the OPF board. So any member can, any paying member can put somebody on the board. And they don't tell us, they don't um, dictate this, the, the um, direction of the organization. We more the permanent employees, we look for opportunities, things that we think are interesting, and we listen to the board as well. Then we present options and they kind of pick options for us, um, is 
the best way of summarizing the way we're steered. Um, and then we have affiliate members. These will be people who run open source projects we think are worth um, supporting. So we'll, we'll help them with their efforts and they help to promote our, um, the OPF within their circles as well. Um, so, and then finally, we look for project funding. Um, and one of the, the most successful effort there was probably the Vera PDF project. And although that was a Euro, an EU funded project, we actually worked as, as a subcontractor to a member of that project rather than being part of the project. Um, and we also partake in international projects that our members are interested, think we can offer something to help. Um, we're currently involved in the ARC project, which is, um, uh, it's a, um, community of archive, national archives looking for interoperability standards um, for information exchange between those international archives. Um, so yeah, that's, they're, they're, they're the three ways we, um, we, we get work, um, we, we bring money in, um, and we use that to do various different things. So we have developed our own software um, through funding the Vera PDF, but we also support um, existing open source projects or even adopt them. Um, a good example is Jove, which is used by an awful lot of organizations around the world. Um, when it was originally developed by Harvard, passed through to Gary McGath, who supported it for a few years, but then put his hands up and said he could no longer support it. And again, some of our members came to us and asked if we'd step into the void there. So we now support Jove ourselves, um, but one of our problems is we have two full-time employees, three part-time employees, so we're not a large organization. I'm the only technical member of staff. So what we're really trying to do is leverage um, our members, a collaborative effort from our members. So it's how we can get members and members of the wider community, digital preservation community involved in our projects. And that's something that we're still working on and we're getting better. So um, we've that found by organizing so rather than just wait for random um, contributions to projects by organizing collaborative efforts like a, um, a joint hack week, we've managed to get a few more people interested and it's a little bit like one, one person at a time. You know, as you say, you drag somebody in, they drag somebody else in and we are, as I say, it's something we're definitely getting better at to the point where the next Jove release, which will be the end of this year, will be our first ever community developed release. I don't think we've actually done any work on it ourselves other than coordinate the work. And yeah, so that's really where we're at the moment, we're trying to expand our um, efforts is getting better at involving different communities and coordinating those communities. So not necessarily technical effort for myself, more project management effort from new members of staff, just to try to better coordinate um, group um, open source contributions and our, our contributors. I think that's about my five minutes, so I'll, I'll stop there and hand over to somebody else. Great, Carl, thank you. Uh, why don't we transition to Carolyn? Do you wanna go next? Yes, that sounds great. You all can hear me, right? Yes. Awesome, okay. Um, I also do not have visuals, and thank you, Carl. Uh, some of what you said might be echoed in uh, what Sam Vera has been up to as well. So Sanvera, for those of you who don't know, is an open source community, a software community that uh, set out to create a series of free to use software, basically uh, building blocks that can be put together in various combinations to achieve a repository system. Um, it started out as the Hydra project and we changed our name to Sanvera. And there were four original partners and that was back in 2008. That was Stanford University, the University of Virginia and the University of Hull, as well as Fedora, which is you know now part of Duraspace slash Lyricist. Um, the framework itself for Simvera is a series of, or I should say, there's a number of Ruby gems. Um, they can be configured and adapted to serve a bunch of different um, needs that people have across the community. We have solution bundles as well. Um, one is called Haiku, which is backed by um, something called Hyrax. Um, and it's your more traditional institutional repository where there's a self-deposit feature, people, faculty, you know, students, whomever can upload their uh, scholarship. Um, it also has a digital collections feature. So there is some management there for uh, people who might be working with uh, users. Um, and then the other solution bundle is called the Avalon Media System. Uh, that's mainly geared towards streaming media. 
So it focuses on the unique needs of, of AV. Um, I would say generally the community is really uh, trying to uh, create a sustainable future for digital libraries, um, create better software than one can create on uh, by yourself. Um, we have, um, we're kind of organized in different layers. So Simvera has uh, formal partners. Um, we have about, I think we have 34 partners now. Um, many of those are from the US, uh, but the, about 10% of them come from UK, Ireland, and Canada. Um, we have many more adopters. So adopters haven't made that formal agreement that they will be participating and contributing back to the community. Um, but uh, they essentially adopt the software and implement it. Um, so there is uh, people from um, Mexico, France, Hong Kong, Spain, Australia, Germany. Um, and that's just what we know of uh, with open source software. Uh, you can't always easily track uh, where it's being implemented. Um, and just to give you um, a little more uh, background about the organization of Sambera, um, apart from partners and adopters, um, the sort of work getting done happens in what we call working groups. Uh, there is a system around um, forming a working group. It usually has a set of deliverables. Um, and sorry, someone's banging outside my office. <laughs> um, uh, so there's working groups and then there's also interest groups um, and we have a very heavily used uh, Slack community. A lot of people are um, online all the time <laughs> uh, talking about uh, uh, different things in the community. Um, we also have something called um, the Roadmap Council, and that is new since we grew so much over the past 10 years. We've actually implemented, uh, we actually discussed for two years, um, uh, creating a different governance structure to Samvera. We were really getting too large. Um, so part of that, um, which the partners all uh, gave thumbs up to, part of those changes were creating a Roadmap Council. So in the Roadmap Council, um, we really, um, there's representatives from like solution bundles as well as service providers. Um, and um, they just try and track uh, different community efforts and where different projects are going, I guess you could, you could say, um, sort of trying to align roadmaps of, or even deep duplicate effort um, because the community is so diverse. Um, you might find out that someone's working on a project with a certain partner to develop a feature, whereas three other partners were already talking about that feature as well. So why don't we bring them together as opposed to create two separate solutions? Um, and then the last, um, so I talked about working group, interest groups, um, and the Roadmap Council. And lastly, there is a steering group. Um, and contrary to the name of steering, um, we actually don't steer at all. Um, we're really more um, to keep the, the, the finances and the administrative sort of home for the um, contributor licenses and things like that. Um, let's see, in 2016, I like to have some numbers. So in 2016, uh, there were over 14,000 commits from 134 people uh, to the different um, GEMS. Um, and now we have over 334 contributor licenses. Um, not everyone's actively contributing, but we've definitely keep increasing in terms of bringing in people to make commits to the code. Um, and that's from over 74 organizations. So you also don't need to be a formal partner to, to hold a license and um, wanna you know, make a pull request. And I talked a lot about code, but really um, the community is much larger, larger than just developers. We have a lot of metadata um, specialists um, and repository managers um, in the community as well. Um, so with that, I think I'll hand it off uh, to the next person. Thank you, Carolyn. Mark, would you like to go? Sure. Um, so as Nicholas said, I'm talking about the Public Knowledge Project, which uh, is a, um, an organization that is hosted uh, at my institution, Simon Fraser University. Um, its primary goals are to develop open source software, uh, most notably and most popular um, uh, open journal systems, which is used to publish a journal and also manage the editorial and submission workflows. Uh, we also have other products that are not quite as well known, but we have things uh, 
like Open Monograph Press, which is the equivalent for monograph public publication and, and editorial processes, Open Conference System, um, a, a, a metadata harvester, and other products that are uh, in the pipeline, uh, like a preprint server. It was founded in 1998 at the University of British Columbia by John Molinsky, who is still our uh, managing, uh, still our, uh, our director. Uh, in 2005, it moved to Simon Fraser University uh, as part of a sustainability uh, uh, plan. Uh, PKP has been international from the very beginning. One of John Walensky's primary goals was to a a empower anybody with the minimum technical means, that is to run a web server or know someone who runs a web server, to publish a journal, a peer-reviewed peer journal. So that, that particular goal was baked in from the very beginning. Um, and uh, his, John's dream has come to fruition. Uh, uh, OJ, OJS is used uh, extensively internationally to publish journals. And I'm going to uh, just paste into the chat um, a link to the, the map, what we call the map, where uh, it, we show um, frequency of journals based on region. If you go to that link, uh, there's a, it's actually a visualization over time. So you'll see a, a yearly counter in the upper right hand corner. Um, but when it gets to 2018, uh, you will see that uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is our biggest install base with over 2,800 journals publishing in that region. Uh, next is Europe and Central Asia. Uh, following that is East Asia and the Pacific. Um, with North America being way down on the list, it's a fraction of what those three I just mentioned are. Um, likewise, we have uh, OJS uh, translated into a number of, uh, sorry, number of languages, and I'll just paste that into the chat as well. So as far as the software goes, it is deployed widely internationally and it is, people are engaged with it internationally as far as translations go. Um, PKP's uh, staff is located not just in North America, Canada and the US, but also in Germany, Scotland, Brazil, and Greece. Um, we, our translation coordinator is located in Germany. Um, our uh, biannual conferences have been in Europe and in Mexico. And we have uh, undertaken a partnership with Crossref such that we uh, are a sponsoring organization for journals published in countries that are, according to the uh, World Bank, low income countries. And that means that uh, we have brokered a deal with Crossref so that uh, DOIs are free to, to qualify journals uh, in those countries. Another uh, example of our international reach, and maybe this is getting more into the infrastructure kind of component of, of the, today's discussion, is the uh, Public Knowledge Project Preservation Network. Uh, this is a uh, uh, initiative to allow any OJS journal, regardless of whether it's open access, uh, total access, what have you, uh, that meets minimum requirements, including having an ISSN and a, a minimum level of open journal systems, to uh, be preserved in a global locks-based preservation network. Uh, and we have, um, again, reflecting the kind of counts that I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the, the number of journals participating in the network uh, it kind of mirrors the numbers uh, of journals implemented uh, internationally, with the exception that the United States is actually the, large, the country with the most journals represented in the network. Uh, but Brazil is second. So uh, it, that's a very important uh, initiative and service to us. Uh, we also have uh, nodes in that network, storage nodes in North America, Europe. And just this summer, we're working with IBICT in Brazil to establish a node south of the equator. So this will be our first preservation node uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. We uh, are particularly prominent in Latin America. We've got huge, huge implementations in, in Latin America. Uh, I was just in Brazil a couple of weeks ago at a conference and OJS is everywhere. Literally every institution, every university publishes an OJS and it's uh, just ubiquitous. 
Um, some other uh, initiatives we've undertaken in Latin America are uh, the, we have a PKP school, which is an online training forum for editors mainly, but we've partnered with UNAM in Mexico, the autonomous university there to translate two of those large courses into Spanish because we have such a large uh, Spanish uh, install base. Uh, we're working with Cielo in Brazil to develop a preprint server application, and we have other ties to Cielo as well. And probably as a result, as a, a, one of the reasons we are uh, so well known in Latin America is that one of our uh, associate directors, Juan Pablo Alperin, who's also a faculty member in the communications uh, department here at Simon Fraser University, um, specializes in studying open access in Latin America. So we have pretty big success internationally, but I have to say that one of the challenges we've had is lack of diversity within PKP's organizational uh, structure. Almost everyone who sits on a PKP committee is from uh, English North America. I say that as a Canadian, Canada and the US. Uh, we've only got um, one uh, financial supporter from outside of Canada and the US and that is Cielo. The only group within PKP that is uh, represented internationally well is the technical committee where we have uh, members from Europe and South America. So uh, even though we um, are present internationally and active internationally, uh, when it comes to the organization itself, we're not very diverse. I think that's one of our biggest challenges. Uh, and that's all. Thank you, Mark. Lauren, do you want to pick up? Is Lauren still on the call? No. Oh, there we go. Great. Lauren, if you're speaking, we can't hear you again. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yeah. Uh, yep. It's like hopping between things. Okay. Uh, and you can see my screen? Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay. Um, so Lauren Co, University of North Texas Libraries, working with the Web Archives and have been sort of a project lead on Open Wayback since late 2016 for the International Internet Preservation Consortium. Um, so Open Wayback International Collaboration, um, Open Wayback is software that provides access to web archives by putting back together web content preserved in work files for end users to view in a web browser. Um, where did it get its start? Um, it actually started not with an international support base, but with the Internet Archive. If you've been to archive.org and looked up old captures of URLs, this is their Wayback Machine. And in the early 2000s, they were running a closed source, not really extensible version of Wayback. Um, and because of this, they decided to implement an open source Java-based Wayback, uh, which they first released in 2005. Um, the Wayback Project Becoming International came about in 2013. Uh, the Internet Archive, a member of uh, the IAPC, met with a number of other IAPC members, uh, many national libraries who are running Wayback instances as well, uh, to discuss relaunching Wayback as a true open source project managed by the IAPC. Um, and the reason they wanted to do this was that even though Wayback was open source now, it wasn't easy for just anyone to contribute code, and it had some branding and infrastructure ties to the Internet Archive. Uh, so by having IAPC take over the code base, the project would no longer be dependent on one institution, which would make it more sustainable. And it would allow broader community involvement in the software development and knowledge sharing. So hopefully institutions everywhere aren't implementing different solutions to the same problems. Um, and IAPC was also willing to take on responsibility of doing formal releases which isn't something Internet Archive necessarily wanted to commit to. Um, so at this meeting, uh, 
um, certain requirements were outlined uh, for more inclusive direction um, in, for the international community, including support for internationalized domain names so that URLs could contain non-ASCII characters, which is important internationally, um, and to allow for easily configurable localization so that text in the user interface could be non-English. Um, so in late 2013, IEPC took over responsibility for Wayback and moved, uh, moved it to GitHub and it became Open Wayback. Um, it made sense for Open Wayback to uh, become internationally supported. The web is international, uh, so its archives need to work internationally um, with a lot of national libraries running Wayback, but the web archiving community being relatively small, it made sense for libraries to share solutions. Um, and also because members of IAPC largely contributed to the development of the work file format standard for storing uh, web archived content, it made sense for them to work together on tools that support the standard. Um, initial goals for supporting Open Wayback included having three institutions contributing code at any time, providing up-to-date documentation, uh, having different roles of contributing outlined. Um, and then for two years, IAPC funded the National Library of Norway to work on development. Uh, but when that funding ended, uh, support became wholly volunteer-based. Uh, various modes of support and communication have been via mailing lists, GitHub, regular WebEx calls, which were first specifically for Open Wayback uh, alone. And now it's more a part of a, a broader IAPC open source software call, which they call OSOS. Um, and then IAPC also has an open Wayback channel in Slack. Um, this is a map of contributions uh, on GitHub for open Wayback and Web Archive Commons, which is a dependency also managed uh, by IAPC. Um, so challenges to collaborating internationally, obviously face-to-face -face is difficult. Um, which can change the dynamic of a project. And then even for online calls, time zones are a challenge. Uh, so at least two times, we'll have to have at least two different times for calls if we want to uh, enable everyone to participate who wants to participate. Um, as far as IAPC being the backbone of the project support, um, membership in IAPC is institutional. So it means uh, that involved developers already have full-time jobs. So getting development time from the community isn't that easy. Um, and then not specific to international challenges. Um, it's one thing to get small fixes uh, contributed, but with a large code base, it's difficult for bigger changes. Um, not everyone wants to go the same direction and everyone is a volunteer. Um, but there are benefits. We have 44 unique contributors to Open Wayback and Web Archive Commons. Um, so the project has stayed alive. Um, which it may not have if dependent on just one institution or a few institutions. Uh, the localization got implemented. Uh, libraries around the world have a means to serve web archives um, without all doing their individual solutions. Um, and uh, while time zones can be bad for communication, for calls and getting together, it's good for support because there's usually one of the contributors is available via GitHub or Slack if someone needs support. Um, and then collaboration uh, um, encourages adhering to standards and stronger community relationships. And that's all. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. And so last up, we have Natasha. Mm -hmm. Great, let me try to share my screen. Um, sure. Lauren, can you um, exit the share? Um, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for where uh, my Zoom thing went. Oh, yes. Stop share button. Great. Okay. Let me try now. Okay, great. Can you let me know whether you can see anything? Yeah, we can we can see some slides. Okay, okay, excellent. So yes, my name is Natasha Milich Framing and today I will be um, telling you more about UNESCO Persist. Um, uh, in particular, um, a couple of efforts that the, about the organization and how Persist fits within UNESCO and then activities that we are um, uh, developing with the community. So 
Uh, you may have heard of UNESCO Memory of the World program. Uh, because um, as an organization, UNESCO cares about education, science, and uh, culture, and um, um, access to uh, knowledge um, without any barriers and obstruction around the world. So it's very much an international organization. Um, in, you may have also heard that UNESCO has uh, um, pr pr protective, you know, um, over, um, overseeing uh, kind of power over um, heritage that is national, cultural importance around the world. So um, and UNESCO has been very well known for preserving physical uh, artifacts uh, and sites. Um, however, um, besides that, there's lots of work done in documentation, again, with physical books and manuscripts. And in order to preserve those, the first step was uh, engaging with uh, organizations who would have resources and um, um, often contribute to uh, digitalization of uh, uh, very important artifacts, physical artifacts. So, we, having in mind, of course, that once you digitalize things, then you can make them available to the rest of the world in, in, in a way that um, uh, does not disadvantage in any way uh, countries th that do not have the means uh, 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 and people who do not have access to uh, enough means to, you know, to, to, to use the uh, um, cultural heritage of the world. So yes, UNESCO is very much concerned about economic aspects as much as policy aspects, as much as uh, uh, process, processes and um, uh, technology aspects that would enable uh, sharing of information. However, what happened since, you know, from going from physical now, we're coming to born digital. So even when it comes to preserving uh, historical um, um, heritage, uh, there is an issue of technology that is facilitating this. And I'm giving you just an example where um, researchers that just happen, I happen to know at University of Nottingham put lots of effort with many other experts to uh, recreate, say, the um, simulations or through simulations that kind of life in an economy of a region that actually is long gone now. And they have spent lots of time, lots of effort uh, creating lots of different artifacts and then uh, well, last time I spoke with them they said oh after three years everything stopped working so because the digital eco ecosystem is extremely complex and the digital ecosystem um, now depends on technologies that are extremely volatile uh, digital technologies are here on the, on the, sc on the screen you can see um, digital technologies are extremely create an extremely complex ecosystem where there are lots of dependencies among different components from operating systems uh, to applications to the protocols and so on. Yet on the other hand, on the right hand side, we have the digital assets that um, um, experts in different domains create, but they're all dependent on digital technologies. So, so now UNESCO needs to deal with a much, much bigger complexity um, because the digital, the, there are lots of born digital materials, of course, but also digital technologies used to preserve the cultural heritage. So um, uh, dealing with the digital technologies becomes extremely, extremely important. And so they put in place um, an initiative called Persist, which is really focusing on anything digital uh, in relation to preserving the cultural heritage. And they started uh, very gradually in 2013 and uh, UNESCO is an extremely complex organization so uh, one has to be able to fit into their structure there's absolutely no way you can um, take an initiative and then just run with it you have to understand where and how within the persistent mechanism um, you can function and one thing needs to be absolutely clear UNESCO does not pay for anything. UNESCO doesn't employ people except UNESCO employees. When it comes to an initiative, the UNESCO primarily pro uh, uh, provides support to raise money, support to build community. So it has an extremely um, important role as a, as a, uh, as a convening, convening power that can bring uh, um, leaders of 200 member states and then you can present to 200 member states 
what you decide uh, or the committee has decided to be the best way forward. Uh, often the, um, the path is um, to engage with the community to understand the problem, then create guidelines and then push them to the UNESCO or to member states. And then finally, once the member states understand what's going on, then they have to uh, locally uh, create programs to implement. So it's a long, long path. However, it's very, very um, impactful when it happens. So I just want to show you uh, if you want um, on UNESCO PES, uh, Persist website, there are there's some information. And uh, um, a chair of, uh, of the persist, and then under David, there are three other chairs. Um, I'll give you more information about the structure. So the structure is divided in three areas and each area has a chair. So for the policy group here, you can see Robert Buckley uh, for um, a, a pro a content and best practices in the Perron, and for technical aspects is myself. So, so the way it works then, for example, uh, the content and best practices group uh, formed uh, a working uh, that working group formed a committee that then engaged the community um, to talk about and find out what would be the guidelines for selection of the, uh, with the community that came up with the guidelines and then presented to UNESCO and then it was then um, more broadly distributed whatever you do with UNESCO may, has to be done in multiple languages in multiple countries um, what was already mentioned uh, we heard from previous presentation uh, presentations achieving this um, international reach and diversity uh, within UNESCO, that's a must. Uh, essentially, nothing else can happen unless you, you, you can show that there's a capacity uh, to have this global impact. And, and these guidelines have been translated in many languages now. Similarly, recently, we team, they teamed up with the Digital Preservation Coalition. And uh, the key was to, again, uh, work with the community to understand how uh, domain experts in preservation could actually make a case to management that there should be an investment in digital preservation so that now you can um, access the online, you can access the executive guide. And, but this executive guide really is uh, how do you have a dialogue with, um, with, with, um, with the management leadership to, to position the digital preservation. And then the final thing I just want to say, UNESCO basically sits between the providers and the enablers of uh, technology, either dealing with these issues that uh, obsolescence of technology um, cause, or use the technology for preservation purposes. So UNESCO is kind of sits between um, and is trying to engage particularly with commercial sector uh, and um, open source community because they are the producers of software and without them we really can't solve the problem we need to work together with them and finally I just want that is sort of taking care of open source uh, software they are accumulating the, um, the, the um, open source code and in one place and uh, uh, this is already now outdated but i just want to show you we're talking about really really huge numbers of projects that uh, they, they they basically in the repository will uh, attempt um, to preserve because one main claim here is that even our code is the heritage and recently there have been agreement between uh, unesco and um, inria in collaboration to make sure that software is treated as heritage and then is, the code will be maintained. Yeah, so I'll just stop here. Thank you. Um, um, I can answer any questions later. Thank you, Natasha, and thank you to, to all the presenters for their presentations. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes left. Obviously, a lot of different directions we could go in. I'm going to 
kick it off with hopefully what is a relatively targeted question and then open it up to the group for questions they want to ask. Um, so I want to pick up on something that Carolyn said. She was talking about the, the implementation of a roadmap council. And I'm curious um, if there's one specific um, new sort of aspect of uh, like a governance framework or a social framework that um, you're looking to implement for your initiative in order to foster more international collaboration, uh, more users, or more contributors to your projects. And I'll put that out there for, for any of the presenters who want to respond. Uh, don't feel like you have to. And maybe I can put Carolyn on the spot and say, ask her if she would say a little bit more about um, the Roadmap Council for Sambera specifically and, and how, uh, how the Sambera group is thinking about um, what benefits that will bring or what was the need that motivated that innovation in, in the governance framework. Sure, I can talk a little. Um, so I will say, like, I, I was actually asking, um, I've been involved in the community since about 2012, so about four years into its inception, and I was, I was in, interested um, by the intentional, intentionality of being international. Um, and I won't out anyone because I know this <laughs> call is being recorded. Um, but um, the person said that the partnership uh, was intentional, but the internationalness was maybe more a bit accidental. Um, and so I think uh, with the Roadmap Council, <laughs> Sanvera is such a, it is a diverse organization in that we, we function as a meritocracy. Um, and that's when we decided, when we got so large though, we realized we really that there needed to be um, there needed to be a body that minimized conflicts uh, between uh, individuals and organizations that were uh, developing on the code base. Um, so that's really the the intention of the roadmap council, and we did include service providers because they are part of our community, and some of our service providers do come from um, mainly the UK at this point. Um, and so the, uh, we have a representative from the UK on the on the roadmap council. Um, the other uh, people who sit on the roadmap council come from the solution bundles. They're the product owners. Um, and then we also have a core components uh, a core components <laughs> uh, working group. Uh, so those are really all the like someone who represents all the gems that are the building blocks for the for the software. So that person sits on the roadmap council as well. Um, so yeah, the, the need was really for a body to uh, identify when cross project development and maintenance spree, sprints uh, needed to be arranged and really to help with coordinating communication um, to the community about the activities going on. Um, I, so I hope that maybe helped a little and I wish I could I could speak a little bit more about um, the international makeup, but um, but that's 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 my answer. <laughs> that's great, Carolyn. Thank you. I, I really like that phrase about the collaboration being intentional and the international piece being accidental. Um, do folks from any of the other initiatives want to say anything about um, kind of how they're thinking about uh, innovating on on governance and social frameworks, either for engaging their user communities or their contributor communities? Sounded like someone was starting off there. Lauren, was that you? Yeah. It, it's my, myself, Natasha here. Hi. Um, oh, Natasha, hi. I, just, I just want to say, with respect to um, UNESCO uh, Persist, uh, we have a steering committee, um, and uh, as I mentioned, four chairs, the sort of overseeing uh, the, the working groups. But we have been discussing uh, creating what we call kind of executive committee that would then manage the uh, volunteers because there's so much work to be done um, uh, to engage the community. And so one of the key issues is um, um, how, so it's not about from what motivation, but really distribution of work. And uh, at the same time, we kind of maintain the spirit of uh, um, 
yeah, volunteer work as opposed to ma managed, uh, you know, managed enterprise. So um, that has been on our mind quite a bit uh, because in uh, managing in volunteers, in fact, I find is much higher responsibility than managing your pay pay workers, if you wish, um, uh, because it's, it's valuable time and. Uh, uh, making it absolutely clear that you appreciate and you respect the time and you want to make it as effective as possible really uh, really requires management very good management even better than as I said if you're running the business yeah I think that's absolutely true uh, it being harder to manage volunteers than than staff uh, does anyone any of the other presenters want to weigh in on this question or should we should we open it up to the folks on the call to see if they have questions they want to ask. Yeah, so it's Carl from the OPF. Um, and again, I'd, I would actually just reiterate the point that Natasha made. Um, that's something we're really trying to get better at is actually rather than try to do everything, uh, well, myself to some degree, is better organise the community efforts. And um, we do get quite a lot of contributions. But yeah, it turns out that organizing that level of collaboration is not necessarily my strongest suite but we do have that's one of the reasons we've taken on taken on a couple of new members of staff part-time recently but really with the um aim of better organizing our community efforts um you know because up till then we'll just be the work of myself and if we even if employ another technical person that is only going to double our capacity whereas really if we can coordinate the um the volunteer effort we get properly we're capable of doing a lot more really um but but that as natasha says that level of management is really not straightforward it's certainly it certainly doesn't play to my strengths and um, hence we've yeah we've hired a dedicated project manager for that to that end so it sounds like there's growing recognition of the importance of um investing dedicated resources in community management, community facilitation for, for helping move these initiatives forward. I will say too, this is Carolyn from Zambera on that, on that point. Um, Zambera also is all volunteer at this point. There's no um, hired staff, but uh, we have built up enough reserves uh, to hire two positions maybe not right at the same time, steering's actually working on the job descriptions right now, but one of them is a community manager um, because we also see the benefit in um, having someone who can grow the community, um, you know, in, in the U.S., but, but abroad as well. Um, we're, we're definitely open, um, an open community, so, uh, yeah. So, so maybe picking up on this, this thread of conversation and coming back to something that Mark said about PKP, and how they're explicitly looking to uh, broaden and diversify their, the folks who are contributing, the folks who are involved in governance. How, how are your initiatives thinking about um, broadening and diversifying either your, your contributor community, your governance community, uh, or your user base? Uh, Nicholas, this is Mark. Um, so, so one of the ways that we are looking uh, at addressing this problem is to understand better how funding, uh, the kind of culture of funding in various parts of the world where we're active. So an example that we've seen, and I know, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the, uh, Duraspace, for example, has seen this as well, is Whereas in North America, you're likely to get, especially large universities, for example, who will pay a sum of money towards something like the Public Knowledge Project or Santa or whatever, you know, talking ten thousand dollars, something in that range. Whereas, and that's in, and that could happen in multiple times. Large universities, various large universities, do that. What we've observed in the Europe in Europe is that. It is less like that is less likely to happen. What is more likely to happen is a group of universities will get together, pool their money, and that pool and then and uh, engage with say PKP uh, as a group, not as an individual institution. Um, I think that it, it, for for PKP, we're even though we have uh, a couple of supporters who are financial supporters who are consortia or groups of other universities or other kinds of groups, 
I think we've had an assumption that um, l large funders or large supporters uh, are going to be individual institutions. And that's, I think, one thing that we need to kind of get our head around is um, uh, kind of getting away from that assumption and being more open to the kinds of participation uh, that I was describing, where you have a group of institutions pooling their pooling their resources, um, but also expecting certain kinds of, represent, of representation because they're a group, right? They, in other words, they we have to decide if they get one rep, like a large university would give the same amount of money, or do they get like is there a different mechanism for representing that group that accompanies that kind of organizational structure? Does that make sense? Yeah, Mark, that's great. I, I like that sort of phrase, um, understanding the, the sort of cultures of funding. And I would say a lot of what you described echoes um, our experience with, with locks and mm -hmm. engaging with institutions internationally. I, I would really like to expand on Mark's. I think, Mark, this is a really great uh, thing to sort of reflect upon. Um, as part of the UNESCO persist that um, I mentioned that we have done the gui uh, created guidelines, and this is uh, within UNESCO the best way to drive an um, a initiative or a movement towards a, a solution, to be honest. But to deliver a solution, um, for example, for sustainability of software, um, the organizational structure in the model, the model may have to be completely different. Um, and the um, one thing that we have contemplated quite a bit was creating a foundation, a, a kind of persist foundation that would in fact uh, negotiate uh, with the industry um, so that the licenses are available for uh, memory institutions to use for legacy software. I personally, I work for Microsoft Research for 17 years and I know that it's very difficult on both sides. It's difficult for companies to make decisions on that level. It is difficult for those who need to manage licenses, uh, again, to do the distribution in the right way. So in order to achieve anything at that level, almost requires uh, uh, creating a non-for-profit organization that has a legal entity and has a very clear uh, kind of um, relationship with the rest of the ecosystem based on the models that are well established. So um, in that instance, um, I like to differentiate between the funding that comes for a project, because also people believe, okay, here's a project and it's going to continue forever. Nope, it's not going to continue forever. It's going to end. And if you want to be a project, that's fine. But if you actually want to become an infrastructure and a kind of the whole initiative within the ecosystem and a, a, a player that can make a difference, then then you need to become something else. Project is not enough. And the, so you're looking for models and. Uh, just like uh, Roberto de Cosmo started Foundation for Software Heritage, it is very clear that uh, we have only limited models and sustainability, economic sustainability becomes a real focus then. Thank you, Natasha and Mark. Um, so I'm noticing we have about five minutes left. Uh, maybe that's time for uh, one of the participants on the call, if, if they have a burning question that they really wanted to, to get in, now's your chance. You can either unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I have my input I keeps switching. So I was trying to speak earlier, couldn't be heard. But I did have a oh. question if, if uh, as a participant, um, Carl mentioned the joint hack, hack week to get people involved in contributing. And I was just curious about, you know, how many people were participating in that and kind of what, uh, what modes of communication did you have to coordinate that with international participants? Yeah, hi. We've, you know, we've had different levels of success at different times. I think the most we've ever had on a was actually on an individual day with, with about 20 participants um, and you know organizing the efforts is it's something again something we've got better at so the, it actually requires a fair amount of planning up front um, we've usually 
basically try to corral a set of tasks that we think need doing across one or two products, um, putting them out for volunteers to putting them out as a as a call for volunteers as it were um, and we've generally used some kind of video conferencing um, software that's changed over the years what particular product we use but um, generally yeah video conferencing software to check in maybe once a day or twice a day um, or if it's a single day event three or four times over the day um, and actually the github framework for contributions to either software or documentation, we tend to manage all that through GitHub issues, um, which sometimes means a little bit of training for participants, but even if people can't use the tools, we usually find a way around it, um, you know, prepare the files and send them here and we'll do the rest. But yeah, so really the main tools are video conferencing to check in, um, something like Google Docs and Google Calendars, just to arrange a, a check-in schedule as it were, and the GitHub tools to manage contributions. Okay, thanks. So I'm seeing we're close to the top of the hour. Uh, I think this is a topic that we could probably uh, we could probably have a much longer conversation about. Um, but in the interest of time, I want to um, wrap things up here. I want to say thank you to Corey and Nathan for the invitation for us all to participate. To Nathan for uh, taking what looks like really great notes for this session, and to all of our speakers for. Um, connecting from disparate time zones to uh, make this happen and have a very robust conversation about um, some very diverse collaborative international infrastructure initiatives. Uh, so with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn over to Nathan, who I think has some additional announcements. And, uh, and yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. That was a, a great conversation. Thank you to all our presenters as well. Um, I do have a couple of uh, a couple of brief items. Um, uh, we uh, are looking for um, if any, we're wondering if anyone is interested in potentially um, coming on as co-chair um, in the fall uh, for the infrastructure interest group. Um, uh, Corey is going to be taking sabbatical, um, so we're kind of looking at um, is this a time to to transition into a new co-chair or just sort of uh, be a solo co-chair myself for a while until he's back. Um, just sort of we're trying to be flexible and keep options open if there is someone who is interested. So um, if that is something um, you are interested in, please, please let me know and we can talk about what that um, looks like. Um, there's a monthly meeting uh, with NDSA uh, leadership group, which is the uh, uh, leader interest group and working group co-chairs as well as the coordinating committee. Um, also, um, our October meeting, um, instead of a call, uh, we have a working lunch meeting at DigiPrez. Um, that has been scheduled. The location is not yet been uh, determined, but that is on the DigiPrez uh, schedule. Um, it's, it's sort of that in between DLF and DigiPres, I believe, on the first day um, at 12.50. Um, we tr try to uh, sort of do a Zoom opening um, for that meeting. Um, last year did not work out so well because the Wi-Fi was, was fairly um, poor at the venue. Um, I'm told it may be better, but it might not be better this year. Um, so generally leaning towards maybe not planning a, um, a Zoom session, um, but following up with folks over the lister for that. But I'd um, appreciate it. Um, thoughts on that if anyone uh, has opinions or, or um, just really wants to make sure we try to do a Zoom. Um, but if you have, have thoughts, let me know. Um, that's all I have for interest group business. Um, but thank you again to everyone uh, for, for coming and for our participants um, and presenters. Um, it was a really great conversation. I'll get the, um, get the recording up uh, sometime in the next day or two, um, and the link will be in the notes here uh, when that's available. Um, and at the top of this document is a link to the YouTube playlist. You can also get to that from the webpage for the interest group on the NDSA website. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks.